Kathy. Go ahead. Here we go in three, two, one. And good morning, everyone. Welcome in. Brand new edition of Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. So happy you're with us. My name is Steve Cashel, joined by my co-host. He is Dr. Brian Cole, the head team physician for the Chicago Bulls, one of the team physicians for the Chicago White Sox, sports medicine specialist, orthopedic surgeon at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Our website is sportsmedicineweekly.com, and our producer is Shane Reardon. Dr. Cole, how are you on this Saturday morning? Steve, I'm doing great. It's nice to talk to you again this morning. Well, great. Let's get right into it. We've got a busy show, and we'll finish it off with some great questions from our listeners and our Ask the Doctor segment. But I want to start with this. Um, Understand that uh, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush is doing an interesting study, getting athletes, including elite athletes, back to play following cartilage transplants. Can you tell us more? Steve, what's interesting is what most of us hear about are injuries that are, you know, pretty well understood. Someone dislocates their shoulder, we can stabilize it. Uh, They may, and our baseball players, have a labral tear that we can fix. Uh, And we can fix a Tommy John problem with the onocladal ligament. We can fix an ACL. But there's a rare but really difficult problem that many collision athletes have, and that's where they've torn their meniscus and it had to be removed or they have a cartilage defect in the hard white cartilage at the end of their bones, typically in the knee. And those are more likely than not when they become symptomatic to be career ending injuries. And I, um, we recently have looked at our database to look at elite athletes who have undergone both meniscus transplants where someone else's meniscus who has uh, typically died of a traumatic uh, event, uh, they donate their heart, liver, lungs, but also their cartilage and we use a meniscus transplant or a cartilage graft from a donor, same type of situation. And we decided to parse out our data and say, look, how are we doing with the most demanding of all athletes, including professional athletes in Major League Soccer, the NFL, and the NBA? And what we found is that even the most challenging cases, when they have a very specific problem requiring cartilage replacement surgery, that we've been able to get back people, these individuals, to sports 75% of the time or more, and it's sustainable. In other words, they're not destroying their graphs once they go back to activity levels that they were used to doing pre-injury. Dr. Cole, who would qualify for this? At what age? You know, we are seeing individuals who are typically between 19 and, say, 24. That would be the most common age range. These are uh, athletes who are oftentimes in college, had a previous surgery, they had their meniscus removed, were known to have a cartilage defect, sort of a localized spot of arthritis, who would do well initially after the cartilage surgery, and then they would start to do poorly. They'd have increasing pain and swelling, and they present often after they've signed a, sometimes a multi-year contract with an organization. Wow. Now, uh, can you take us through the process of this and uh, and how it's uh, how it's done uh, in your uh in your surgical centers and operating room? Yeah, I mean, like any other problem that an athlete will have, uh, especially one of this magnitude, we always want to uh, exhaust non-surgical treatment. And that can be, you know, look, education, uh, learning to live with a certain amount of discomfort. It can be um, uh, physical therapy. It could be injections and things like that to sort of uh, placate symptoms. But so these are individuals who have tried uh, and been counseled and tried non-surgical treatment. and. Then it's an issue of getting our arms around what's actually missing, and sometimes they have to undergo what I call index arthroscopy, where we do a uh, procedure where we look in with a camera to to ascertain what's missing, take measurements, and literally you're ordering parts, but these parts are human body parts that uh, have been uh, given uh, from uh, from uh, basically a gift of hope or a gift of life when it's a heart, liver, or lung. And... um, we have a size match graft. It could be a meniscus transplant or it could be a cartilage graft that we literally replace the tissue. And what's different about this compared to, uh, let's say, a heart or lung or liver transplants, the body doesn't see these tissues as foreign. So they don't have to be on medications that will suppress their immune system. So once they receive the graft, typically they're able to challenge it at a high level at six to eight months after their treatment. Uh, certainly it's not a guarantee. These are considered salvage situations where they otherwise have no other opportunities to play uh, in, uh, in, in their sport. Uh, but what we've recently ascertained, as I said, is that once we've looked back at our data and said, look, how well are these athletes doing? About two-thirds of them or more are actually able to get back to sport when they previously couldn't. 
fascinating stuff. Again, uh, Steve Cashel with Dr. Brian Cole. You're listening to Sports Medicine Weekly. We're talking about getting athletes, including elite athletes, back to play following cartilage transplants. And Dr. Cole, take me back even 10 years, five years. Um, you know, these studies are, are really are really neat. Um, did you ever think that, that we'd come to science like this? You know, I think that what, what we have learned over the last five to 10 years is the power of data, and this is no different than professional sports and you know even business uh, we have been collecting just tons of data not really sure how we were going to use it quite frankly but we've been very uh, forward thinking in terms of creating these uh, web-based uh, data repositories uh, for our patients with their consent and it allows us to look at gender at body mass at alignment the number of previous surgeries uh, patient expectation the psychological factors I mean I can list you know a litany of different variables so that you know if you were an individual who came in the office, we can basically predict, not with certainty, but with a high degree of likelihood, how you might or could do with these treatments based upon all those independent variables. That, to me, is the, mo the biggest advancement, is how we actually use data to make surgical decisions and actually manage the expectations of patients who are otherwise in a really, in a really bad place. Okay, and finally, on this topic, Dr. Cole, uh, take us through, you know, how this study comes to closure, you know, how it's completed. What what are you looking for as far as, uh, you know, developing your, your study to say, um, you know, we, we now have results? Well, what, what has to happen, Steve, is follow-up. And uh, uh, these patients, because they're relatively rare problems, have been really, uh, have made themselves available, and they're all over the country, and sometimes they're outside the United States. So it requires, uh, uh, we can't get them all in for physical exam or x-rays or MRI, but by self-report, we can at least figure out where they're at and what they tell us in terms of, hey, this is what I was like before my transplant, could not play my sport, this is what I'm doing now. So to get closure on a study like this, you got to have follow-up, and it's got to be more than two years to be meaningful. And one of the things I've learned about in, in elite athletes is that if you have a year's worth of uh, accrued sort of playing ability, that is very predictive of how they're going to do in the future. And unfortunately, most athletes' careers are not 15, 20 years. They're in the, you know, if you look at any sport, they're probably in the average in the five to 10 year range, right? So if we can get a year of a good clinical result, uh, we can sometimes put an athlete back in the pathway now through this follow-up uh, to say that you're going to do well for the next couple of years in terms of what we call survivorship. So determining survivorship is what we need to do uh, to get closure on these studies, and that's really more data collection that, to add on to what we had uh, even before we intervened surgically with these guys and, and, and gals. Terrific stuff, and now let's move on.